Thanks so much. Thanks so much for inviting me and for that really nice introduction and the music as well. Uh, well that's, that's great. Nice to be here. Uh, so, uh, yes, I'm going to talk about open access, like this says. Uh, yeah, I've been doing it for a, for a while now, so I probably won't do the basic stuff uh, about open access. I'm kind of guessing most of you already know a little bit about that, and if you don't know it by now, then you're probably not just not interested. So I'm going to try and do some more uh, interesting stuff. Uh, more current, I'll take you through some, some of the projects and I'm going to try and relate uh, what, I'm, uh, what I've been doing to some of the things we've been talking about. Uh, oh, I've gone quiet, better. Uh, while I've been here, I've been here since uh, Monday taking part in a workshop and had a few conversations. So I'm going to try and uh, fit some of that into what I'm going to talk about as well. Okay, so, so the first challenge when you're given a talk about open access uh, particularly to uh, researchers and academics, uh, is to explain why they should be positively interested in it. Um, my VC is always asking, you know, what's the societal challenge of the things that we do? So, so why they should be actively interested in it rather than feeling it's something that's just been imposed on them top down from governments and funding agencies and institutional research leaders, librarians perhaps, international initiatives such as Plan S, that kind of thing. So instead, as I say, instead of explaining how to publish your work, open access, uh, which means that it's going to be free uh, for readers to read it, and in the versions that we do, it's also uh, free for authors to publish. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start by taking, uh, as an example, a research interest or theme that cuts across a number of different fields in the arts and humanities, and kind of also connects. Uh, closely with the theme of this last week's workshop on collaborative future making. And so uh, this theme concerns the current enthusiasm uh, for ideas of the commons. Let's see if I can drink with this microphone on. Yes, I can. So if we understand the commons as non-proprietary shared spaces and resources, along with the collective and collaborative processes necessary to produce, manage and maintain them, what I want to do is offer you the following proposition as an example of why we should be positively disposed towards open access. And my proposition is this, that if we're actually interested in creating such commons, then we need to act and work and think very differently from the ways in which we do now. And this applies to all those who are known for writing about the commons, such as Hart and Engry here and Isabel Stengers and a number of other people who have been talking about this last week. Now, like many of these thinkers, most of the people that I collaborate with around open access are critical theorists. Unlike these theorists, however, we're theorists who work to reinvent theory and what it is to be a theorist. And we do this by challenging some of the taken for granted categories and frameworks of what it is, of what critical theory is currently considered to be. And specifically, we're interested in moving away from the very individualistic, liberal humanist model that's performed by most theorists today, regardless of whether in the content of their work, they're Marxist, post Marxist, feminists, new materialists, post humanists, accelerationists, whatever. They still act as liberals, even though the content of the theory is very different. Instead of doing this, my collaborators and I are experimenting with the invention of what we might rather teasingly be called anti-bourgeois modes of theory or non-liberal modes of theory. And I'm kind of playing here on an article of Mackenzie Walks called On the Obsessions of the Bourgeois Novel in the Anthropocene. Uh, and I'm kind of suggesting that you know, theory is quite bourgeois, just as the novel is for, for Walk. So this bourgeois theory is its theory that its inhabitants, in its habits of being is well, firstly more consistent with a kind of progressive politics that many of us, certainly in the art and in humanities, espouse. And what I mean by this is that while many of us position ourselves as being on the political left, so we write books and articles about the importance of redistribution and sharing and cooperation and collaboration, Often we act like we're right-wing. 
we operate as rampantly competitive proprietorial individuals who display goal-fixated instrumentalism and that what's important to us are the number of books we publish, the grants we capture, the keynote lectures we give, something I've elsewhere associated with being a micro-entrepreneur of the self. Secondly, we can see such anti-bourgeois or kind of non-liberal modes of theory as being more in tune with the changing political zeitgeist, and especially the shift from representative to direct forms of democracy, some of us have been, been talking about the last few days. And it's a shift that can be traced at least as far back as the horizontal ground sw swell against the old politics of the liberal establishment that was a feature of the 2014 Scottish independence uh, referendum. And today we can see it in the decentralised manner in which the Extinction Rebellion movement down there operates. Its refusal of hierarchical organisation in favour of bottom-up affinity groups, as in this nurse in outside Google's London HQ. We can also see this uh, in the Brexit Party's rapid rise to prominence since its launch in just March 2019. And its uh, adoption, let's go back there quickly, uh, of the digital savvy electoral strategy of Beppe Grillo's five-star movement um, in Italy. Then, last but not least, we regard anti-bourgeois theory as being more appropriate to today's post-digital world than printed and closed access books and journal articles. Now, I've been asked to talk about open access, and if you're interested in this topic, there's a, this great new article by uh, Sam Moore, who's an ex-PhD student of mine, and he provides an alternative history of the open access movement. And the usual origin story for open access as it's centred around the hard sciences and the kind of liberal techno-solutionism of the 2002 Budapest Open Access Initiative. What Sam does, what's interesting about uh, this article, is he traces that prehistory of open access back through early 1990s scholar-led humanities journals, journals such as Surfaces and Postmodern Culture. And it's precisely this latter, more humanities-oriented and theory-oriented tradition of open access uh, that my work belongs. So, 20 years ago, which is three years before the Budapest uh, initiative, I helped launch, as Bose just mentioned, the Culture Machine Open Access Journal of Critical Cultural Theory. Do you want to shift in? Rather, you'd say you don't have to stand all the time. I can, I can pause while you... Yeah, that's better. Then in 2008, Culture Machine became a founder member of the Open, of Open Humanities Press. And this press involves multiple semi-autonomous self-organising groups, all operating in a non-rival fashion to make works of contemporary theory available on a non-profit, free, gratis, open access basis. And OTP currently has 21 journals, 40 plus books, distributed across eight book series, as well as experimental kind of Libra texts, such as those in our liquid books and living books about life series. That's an example of that there. Then OHP was in turn a founder member of the Radical Open Access Collective, which is an international community of presses, journals and other projects that was formed after our 2015 Radical Open Access Conference at Coventry, where I work. Now consists of over 60 members, and this collective is building a progressive, alternative ecosystem for publishing in the humanities and social sciences. It's based on experimenting with a diversity of non-profit, independent and scholar-led approaches. We can come back to talk about any of this at the end. Then in the Centre for Post-Digital Cultures, where I work, what we're interested in with that is reinventing elements of infrastructure, especially those involved in the production and dissemination of research and theory. So yeah, journals, lectures, seminar series, conferences, but also community 
supported infrastructure that operates at a larger scale. So archives, museums, libraries. I'll come back to talk about some of those. So how is what we're doing with these projects, how is that more appropriate to today's post-digital world than printed and closed access books and journals? Well, we're arguably in the midst of a fourth great transformation in communications technology. In the first transformation, what happened was the development, we had the development of speech and language. The second transformation was that of writing. The third print, and so now the fourth is the shift from analog to digital media. And in fact, for some, as we can see here, we're now in the post-digital era. As that kind of dis disruption that's been brought about by the digital, that's already occurred. Now, historically, such transformations have often been followed by social and political unrest, and even war. So the development of printing was at the heart of the Protestant Reformation in, the, in 16th century Europe, for example, which broke the religious monopoly of the Catholic Church. And a key figure here, of course, is Martin Luther with his 95 Thesis. However, although historians such as Elizabeth Eisenstein regard print as having subsequently led to the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and development of modern science and democracy, print has its dark side too. So given the anti-Semitic attack at a synagogue in eastern Germany last month, it's worth remembering that shortly before his death in 1546, Luther published a pamphlet called Warning Against the Jews. And this wasn't a one-off. He titled an earlier 65,000-word treatise, so he had a lot to say on the subject, 65,000-word treatise, that was called On the Jews and Their Lies. We are at fault for not slaying them, he becomes in the latter. A text that was exhibited publicly during the Nuremberg rallies. So I'm mentioning that just to get the point across that it's not the disruption of print was good, that of post-digital is bad. Now, we're probably all going to be long gone before anyone knows if we're living through a period of change as profound as that of the Reformation. Still, it's important to come to terms with this shift from analogue to post-digital, not least for political reasons, as the, these examples from German history suggest. For today, it's mainly been those on the populist authoritarian right who have realised the possibilities created by the new post-digital communication technologies. So I'm thinking here, of course, of Donald Trump, who the Guardian called a Twitter genius. He's also known as the first meme president of the United States. You've got Jai Bolsonaro, who's the first president of Brazil, enacted using the internet as his main means of communication. Of course, we've also got the Vote Leave campaign, sophisticated use of Facebook, data to intervene in the UK's 2016 Brexit referendum, as revealed by the Cambridge Analytica scandal. What they and others like them have done is they create a new model of political communications by using the possibilities that are created by this fourth great transformation in media technologies to anticipate the end of representative politics and the shift to more direct forms of democracy using social media and the internet. And this enabled them to overcome the distinction between politicians and the so-called people by sidesetting the old established forms of politics that rely on TV, the press, and meeting people in town halls and community centres. Boris Johnson just doesn't appear on the, on the TV. He won't be interviewed by journalists. And the populist right have done this by the use of repetition of slogans Make America great again, take back control, let's get Brexit done. To link the grievances of a number of disparate groups by articulating anti-austerity, anti-recession and anti-establishment sentiments with a nationalistic flavour. And this enabled them to create chains of equivalent, to link, create links across those sections of the population that have been adversely affected by the results of neoliberal globalisation. 
And in this way, they were actually right to being able to tap into those effective forces, those drives and desires and fantasies and resentments that motivate people to become part of a group and form the basis of collective forms of identification. And they've been assisted in this by Silicon Valley companies. These companies are aware that it's not logical reasoning and verified information, but extreme displays of emotion that keeps audiences hooked and so drives their profits by maximising attention. So not only have Twitter and Facebook and YouTube blurred the distinction between making considered public comments on the current issues of the day and impulsively emitting one's half-formed private impressions of them, They've actively amplified and rewarded expressions of anger, hatred, insecurity and shame. After all, communications on these platforms don't have to be true to go viral. They just need to be maximally compelling. So being controversial, crude, vulgar, abusive, narcissistic, sentimental, contradictory, it all works which is how we have, currently have a situation in which small numbers of people, so we have Nigel Farage and the Brexit Party in the UK, those who follow Trump and who watch Fox News in the US, Matteo Salvini here and his followers in Italy. Small numbers of people are able to use post-digital tools to move large numbers of people in the directions of new forms of populism. And this is because this kind of hyper-emotionalism plays straight into the hands of the reactionary nativist right, which defines itself negatively against the other, thus leading to the rise in sexism, racism and white supremacism we've experienced in recent years, along with phenomena such as Gamergate, incels here, mass shootings in Charleston, Quebec, Christchurch and now East Germany. And in fact, this anti-liberal right have been so successful in mainstreaming their ideas I mean, they do make brilliant viral videos and memes, often using languages and images that are full of humour, irony and ambiguity, as well as, of course, fright and bitterness, that they've completely transformed the political landscape. So we now live in a post-truth world of fake news, alternative facts, climate change deniers, Holocaust deniers, and, as we know, people who are anti-immigration too. Now, as some of us have been talking this last few days, the left has its own effective emotional themes when it comes to critical theory. My theme, you just have to say words like commons, collaborative, Anthropocene, environment, material, even effect, to realise that. You go, okay, I went to a conference in January and you mention any of these words, everyone claps and goes, yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interaction, it's like pantomime. He's behind you. Yet whereas the nativist right have succeeded in using effect as a mobilising political force, the left have been conspicuously bad at turning their representations into actions that make different people, especially those in the mainstream, want to constitute themselves as a group around issues such as the commons. Now yes, we've recently seen a spate of large-scale youthful protests, albeit for different reasons, in places such as Hong Kong and Barcelona, Lebanon, Iraq, Egypt, Ecuador, Ecuador Chile what some people are calling the children of the 2008 financial crisis. But as yet, little of this has transformed into mainstream political change of the kind that the populist right have achieved. And, you know, perhaps this is not surprising. After all, the left is less about the kind of extremes of emotion that drive the right. And it's more about equality, solidarity and mutual aid. Society today is also so fragmented, pluralistic and diverse that it's far easier to unite people around what they're not and who they're against than what they are and who they're for. So that's all a kind of very quick account of why it's important to come to terms with this change from analogue to post-digital. The next question is, well, how can we use these new post-digital communication technologies for more progressive purposes? that are attuned to this changing political landscape. Now, for a long time, it seemed like 
There was no alternative to the two kinds of neoliberalism that we now see in the global West and North. So you had the global neoliberalism associated with Barack Obama and Tony Blair and David Cameron, which depends on a rule of law based system of economic governance. And then you've got the libertarian neoliberalism of Trump and Boris Johnson, who want to destroy this rules based system as embodied most obviously by the EU, so that they can generate new disruptive business opportunities that are free from that kind of regulation. In recent years, however, there have been signs that an alternative is emerging. So examples include, and they're not limited to this, the kind of grassroots, bottom-up groundswell against the media and political establishment that are associated with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the US and her use of social media. We've also got the rise of the platform cooperatism movement internationally, along with associated calls for the monopolies of Google and Facebook to be brought up and for people to own their own data, as explored in Barcelona by Francesca Brea and the housing activist and turned city mayor Ada Colau. It's with this kind of emphasis on using post-digital communications for purposes that are grounded in principles of openness and caring and sharing and redistribution that my collaborators and I align, our, align ourselves and since a number of us, as I say, are theorists, one of the th things we're interested in as part of this is rethinking theory in the aftermath of the digital. It seems to us that in contrast to the worlds of music and film, TV and even politics, if we sing, this transformation from analogue to digital to post-digital has only just begun as far as the practices of the arts and humanities are concerned, as far as what academics, how they work which is another reason why we should all be positively interested in experimenting with radical open access. We need to catch up. It's going to happen to us anywhere, just as iTunes and Spotify disrupted the music industry and Netflix is busy disrupting TV. So one of the questions we're asking with our work is, might exploring new modes of authorship and ownership and redistribution and reproduction that are more in tune with this fourth great transformation in communication technology we've talked about, might they have the potential to lead to non-neoliberal, but also non-liberal ways of being and doing as academics and theorists? Ways that are more consistent with the kind of progressive politics that many of us espouse. And over the last 20 years, we've been involved in developing a number of bottom-up, scholar-led, open access projects for the production of free resources, infrastructure, and the commons. I'm not going to talk about all of those. I've already mentioned two or three. I'm just going to talk about one of the, the latest of these, which is Bo mentioned earlier. This is Copium, which comes from a consortium of six open access presses called Scholar Led. Now, Copium is designed to address another of the challenges that are currently facing open access. And that, this is that of making open access book publishing resilient while at the same time shifting it away from the kind of surveillance capitalism model of com competing commercial service providers. So as Leslie Chan makes clear in an article I'm going to reference a bit, uh, a bit more later, companies such as Elsevier here and Springer are increasingly looking to monetize not just academic content but the entire knowledge production workflow from article submissions to metrics to reputation management and global rankings and the related data extraction. So the open access movement may feel it's won the fight about, say, making journal articles open with Plan S, and you've got things like the policy for the UK's 2021 REF exercise, but it's lost the war when it comes to the rest of the research process. So it's kind of won one little battle right in the middle there, and then the rest of that it's kind of swamped. So Copium represents an alternative, more horizontal and cooperative knowledge sharing approach, which systems and infrastructures are instead collectively managed by the scholarly community themselves for the common good. And as was mentioned earlier, it's been funded by Research England, as the project has one of its aims to show how open access books and not just 
journal articles can be included in the UK's next REF exercise, that's 2028. And again, it seems kind of indicative of this changing zeitgeist that Research England have chosen to fund a dissented, hor horizontally organised, community-led and owned project. It's not going for that kind of top-down hierarchical pro uh, kind of project that's always gone for in the past. So. Something seems to be shifting. Okay, so unless I've completely failed in the last 20 minutes, hopefully now you begin to get the sense of how my collaborators and I are operating a little bit differently to the kind of individualistic, liberal, humanist way of working that's adopted by most researchers in the arts and humanities. Now there are a number of further dimensions to this new, what I'm kind of teasingly called anti-bourgeois mode of theory uh, that we're experimenting with, so I'm just going to quickly emphasise a few of these for you now. So, to begin with, there's a rec recognition that in the post-digital era of YouTube, Instagram and TikTok, which I know you're all on, Gutenberg media such as writing and the book are not the natural or normative means by which knowledge is necessarily generated and re research communicated. So, while we still publish conventional print books and journal articles, our theory might not necessarily take the form of a piece of writing at all. We're increasingly involved in opening knowledge up to being not just post-digital, but what you might call post-grammatological or post-literary, post-writing too. And we're doing this by creating, publishing, disseminating our work in the, in the form of open access uh, films, videos and, via, uh, and virtual augmented and immersive media environments like that there. So just to give you an example, Adnan Hadzi and Co's collectively produced uh, After Video Project. This was published by OHP in 2026. This is a collection of digital videos produced as an actual physical object, namely an assembly on demand video book, which is all that there, stored on a Raspberry Pi computer and packaged in a VHS case, case anyone remembers those, which explores the future for theory after both books and video, and it includes a, a video essay down there, uh, the three of us made back in 2010 as part of our Liquid Theory th TV project. That was a, uh, a video essay on Deleuze's postscript on the societies of control, and it, strangely it was actually popular. It's such a dark subject matter. Another way that we're opening knowledge to being post-literary is by reinventing hardware, software, and network infrastructures especially those facilities that involve in the production and dissemination of research on a radical open access basis. So again, we've got books and journals, obviously, but as I say, we're also involved in developing projects that operate at a larger scale. So to provide an example of something you can easily do here, this is the Mandela 27 digital platform that my colleague Jacqueline Corsten and others created for the Robben Island Museum in South Africa. And this included, as you can see here, an open source pop-up exhibition of Nelson Mandela's cell. This consisted of a few pieces of wood to form the dimensions of the cell, a bucket and a blanket. These were then supplemented by an interactive map, digital images, 360 views of the prison and a video with formal, of the former political prisoner. Now this pop-up exhibition here it is on tour. It's toured South Africa and Europe and so far has been visited by well over 150,000 people. However, a DIY kit, this is what you can apply for here, is also available on an open access basis online, along with all the digital material I've mentioned. So this way any school or community can put together their own version of the Mandela 27 pop-up. They don't need to go and travel to a bricks and mortar museum or art gallery. All they need is the wood, a bucket and a blanket, and then they have it. So open access and the post-digital for us are not just digital, they can be analog too. A second dim dimension of our kind of anti-bourgeois mode of theory concerns the way in which, although we may be theorists, we don't always act as virtuoso authors. 
Instead, we often operate as part of collect uh, collaborative collectives and communities, uh, such as we make here, which is a maker space fab lab in Milan, with whom our colleague Valeria, Valeria Graziano has been exploring the relationship in, between open technologies and healthcare. In fact, our activities as theorists frequently don't involve authoring at all, along with effective labour such as supporting, encouraging, inspiring. They can also involve building, developing and maintaining more than actual authoring, as with the work of another colleague, Marcel Mars, who's system admin with these kind of pirate file sharing libraries, ARG and Ubu Web. And this is because for us theory isn't just a means of imagining, of imagining our ways of being in the world differently. It's a means of enacting them differently too. By producing communication practices and theory that does actually exist, as Bo might put it. So many of our projects are performative in the sense that are concerned not just with representing the world, but also with interacting with it in order to make things actually happen. Some re refer to this as hacking the situation or context. However, we can also understand these endeavours in terms of the prefigurative practices uh, that some of us have talked about this week, of being the change we want to see. So to give you another example, the Public Library Memory of the World project of Marcel Mars and Thomas Left Maddock. This is a pirate library with more than 150,000 titles. It consists of a network of private libraries that, although independent and maintained locally, are connected with the project server through the Let's Share Books software that's been developed by Marcel. And this allows people to search all the libraries in memory of the world, discover a book they want, and import it directly to their own virtual library, which, like the others, is organised using a version of the Calibre open source software for managing digital books. So along with ARG and UbuWeb, Memory of the World can this be understood as a material enactment of internet hacktivist Aaron Swartz's guerrilla open access manifesto. But what's interesting about this project is it's also an example of our interest in infrastructure. Infrastructure is particularly important to us because it concerns the power which is often otherwise hidden to, as we can see here, well, firstly, set agendas and decisions, which are never neutral, but always embedded with ideological assumptions and biases. It sets boundaries of participation. Infrastructure concerns the power also to do discriminate, or not, hopefully, and to control, to control what gets built and what's possible. And the shared aim of all these, what we might call performative or prefigurative projects, is to kind of disarticulate, to pull apart the existing playing field and its manufactured common sense of what it is to be a theorist and a researcher and an academic. And they're seeking to foster instead a variety of antagonistic, radically open access spaces. Spaces that contribute to the development of institutions, environments that are able to counter the hegemony of on the one hand the traditional liberal public institutions such as the university, but on the other private for-profit companies such as Amazon and Academia EDU here. Which is again why those of us who work in the art and humanities should be positively interested in publishing open access like this to help develop such spaces through these kind of experiments and interventions. And I should add that we also see this as a strategic way of responding to the post-truth tactics of the likes of Donald Trump and Boris Johnson that I began with. The liberal establishment is going to find those people frustratingly difficult to engage with on the level of reasoned argument and the agreed facts. It's hard to kind of debate with them like that. I mean, you can hardly shame someone like Boris Johnson and out him as an untrustworthy liar when he's quite upfront about being an untrustworthy liar. So for us, mobilising some of the left's effective drives around commons and collective and collaborative and so on in order to create institutional projects 
as a political force, that for us has the potential to be much more effective. And the idea of all this is to encourage other projects and movements around the world by showing what can be achieved and how things might look if the kind of transformed ways of being and doing that we're talking about were accepted. OK, I'm just going to conclude with two further points. The first, part, the first point I want to make is that the idea behind producing open access resources and infrastructure in this way is to make it possible for these kind of links and chains of equivalence I talked about to be established between our projects and our diversity of other struggles. And these other struggles include the movements associated with Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez that I mentioned earlier, but there's also those featured in our pirate care events, which is the last of our projects that I'm going to mention. We use the term pirate care to refer, refer to two processes. On the one hand, the way basic care provisions that were previously considered cornerstones of social life, such as indeed public libraries, are now being pushed towards illegality as a consequence of the marketisation of public services. But for us, pirate care also refers to the way technologically enabled care networks are emerging in opposition to this drive towards illegality. So the latter include things like uh, the Docs Not, Cox, Not Cops campaign in the UK, in which medical professionals refuse to carry out documents checks on migrant patients. Or you have the migrant rescue boats down the bottom right there, such as those operated by Sea-Watch, that defy the criminalisation of NGOs active in the Mediterranean. Another example in the top right there is Gynepunk in Spain, who's developed a biolab toolkit for emergency gynecological care. So this is what we mean by pirate care, providing the kind of care that's not provided by uh, market forces, but neither by uh, the state and the public. My second concluding point, this is designed to bring us back to where I started with the examples of the commons. As for all, we're trying to establish chains of equivalence between our open access projects and a diversity of other struggles, including the ones I've just mentioned. It's important for us that this network of networks remains multipolar, antagonistic, and to a certain extent, messy. Contrary to the impression that's often given in writing on the comments, achieving unity and harmony and oneness, a kind of, a kind, kind of Kantian perpetual peace, as it were, that's not what creating commons is actually about. In fact, there's no common understanding of the commons. As I showed in Pirate Philosophy, which is a book that was up there a little while ago, open access, creative commons, free software, open source, copy far left movements, all those different movements have, all have very different and conflicting conceptions of the commons. That said, as we know from Chantal Mouffe and other thinkers, the making of a decision in an undecidable terrain, the refusal in this case to take the commons as a, as a, as a given and decide what it is in advance of intellectual questioning, that kind of refusal is just what politics is. So just as we saw, Facebook has data points. And they're kind of weird ones. It's like, what's all that doing there? <laughs> Those are like in Olympics, for football, cricket, or Ramadan. It's like an odd kind of bunch, but anyway. So just as Facebook has a whole lot of data or data points of its own, often these kind of left givens we've been talking about take the form of the very effective emotional drives and desires that constitute the basis of collective forms of left identification, as I was kind of teasingly saying before, seeing the kind of words that underpin most accounts of collaboration in the commons, democracy, human, freedom, sharing, cooperative, collaborative and so on, they kind of produce, often produce something of a dopamine rush in us. Now, of course, my colleagues and I are aware that challenging these kind of petrified academic positions around collaboration in the commons 
you know, around, around our ideas of writing the book and the individual author and ownership and copyright list. Doing all this is difficult. It's hard, it's hard to kind of keep doing it. The tendency is to lapse back into what seems self-evident and taken for granted and common sense. Even though we know that doing so maintains that kind of bourgeois, liberal humanist status quo that Gramsci talks about. So maintaining a degree of multipolarity and antagonism is important as it ensures no single project or platform or conception of collaboration in the commons becomes the one to rule them all. Which is why we want to keep the question of how to create non-proprietary shared spaces and resources uh, in the future open, along with all the processes necessary to manage and maintain them. We want to keep all that radically open. We see doing this as enabling the collaborative way of creating commons that I've been describing to you today to remain political in a manner it's arguable that many others are not. You know, all these kind of, these are some of the data points that we talked about earlier in the week that when you talk about doing open access and the commons, you kind of, these are all left unexamined, unaddressed. At the same time, working like this provides effective desires and emotions with a means of expressing themselves that avoids the kind of conflict between essentialist, non-negotiable identities and values that we've seen as having led to the rise of the populist right in many countries. And we talked, some of us talked last night about how that's happening in Sweden. Just today in the UK, the Conservative Party's saying that <laughs> Labour's immigration policy is going to put a strain on the NHS and schools. Even the unions in the UK are saying that Jeremy Corden has to be tougher on uh, the free movement of people. So this is how we see, by, we don't see just questioning this as just critique, we see this as kind of actually, that's part of the politics of doing this. Okay, thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Gary, for this talk. It was really inspiring. <laughs> I, I think uh, we met uh, a group before your uh, seminar or t talk now. Uh, which I invited just to talk about what kind of other ways do we have parallel to the situation right now when we talk so much about open access on art, uh, of articles and we have to discuss the other kinds of publications also, especially uh, books uh, and the, the kind of publishing that are part of more the fields of humanities and, and social sciences. And what we what we discussed um, was that it, it's 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 um, we are living in in a changing landscape in a way. Sure. And we m noticed that we also talked a lot about something that we re really know still as the book. Yeah. But you were talking a lot about other ways of thinking of knowledge production and communication. Sure. Yeah within this context of that is that we are living in a changing landscape right now. Yeah. So I wonder, um, this change uh, that we can see uh, in the society mm -hmm. uh, of the communication that you also talk about that we have to kind of involve ourselves in, in the research yeah. fields that we are, are uh, working in. How can we how can we come about that when we are still so bound to the traditional ways? We are bound to the books and articles in a way, in the, in the traditions and the culture and the socialization we have sure. within all disciplines, I would say. Sure. Uh, it's difficult. You want me to say this really easy? <laughs> we can do this? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, look, we still do books and articles, okay? So... We still do this because partly we have to, partly we got into this because we love books. My house is full of paper books. I still love paper books. Uh, so it's not this kind of let's you know, get rid of them, let's move on for them. We still like that. But, uh, and this project is all about, the copying project, it's all about how we can do something with monographs. We're going to have to work with um, 
with the institution, what the institution still values and privileges. So we're going to have to we're going to have to stick with that. Um, I guess partly why I was drawing examples. I was talking about how TV is being disrupted by Netflix, how uh, iTunes, uh, even though iTunes is itself gone now, but iTunes kind of disrupted uh, the music industry. It feels like we're a bit in the situation of the music industry when you know piracy came along first along things like Napster and then it's followed by iTunes and they still don't want to change their way of working because they're still going not even like the gramophone and still going we still like the gramophone they still like the records or the CDs and they want to hang on to that and we all I still like albums I've still got uh, this kind of uh, old uh, records so uh, we're stuck with this but it's going to happen to us anyway I mean they're doing this in the same way all those other uh, the music industry TV and we've seen politics it's happening so it's no good saying we still like our books and we don't want anything to change what that means is it the change is just going to happen to us it's going to be done to us what we need to figure out is ways that we can work with this go with this flow but kind of mutate it in ways that we're happy with and we think are important and valuable rather than just get signed up. My university's signed up to lots of this stuff. It's easy. These people come along, they keep coming to the university and they keep saying, buy into our whole package and we'll give you know, you get all of this stuff and it gives you really fine grained details down to the kind of what day of week it is best to publish an article on. Uh, they'll tell you that. They'll tell you what kind of words to use in a title. Long Latin words, not good. Uh, have ni nice little short punchy ones. So they're even getting down to that level of, you know, you think you've got academic freedom, they're kind of gonna, it's going to be much more fine-grained than that. So unless we can come up with ways of uh, countering that, kind of mutating it, diverting it, it's going to happen anyway. So it's not like we have a choice. As much as we still all love books and just as we like our ways of working, it's changing. And what I came to think of when you talked was also that, uh, of course, you coming from from your area of research and yeah. and, um, and uh, the social science and humanities role in this as being critical and also changing yeah. uh, or driving the changing in a way because uh, we might uh, me being a scholar also within mm -hmm. humanities uh, be able to discussing it in, an, in another way because we are part of this yeah. uh, tradition then maybe other dis disciplines ha they might not be able to have that as yeah. part of their yeah. work as researchers yeah, yeah. so how, how, how can we use that as a, sure. as a positive way of yeah. engaging? So one of the big things around open access is it, it generally gets positioned as being dominated by the hard sciences uh, and a lot of the way um, that it's inflicted on the, on, the, on the university is from their interests. So, you know, they've made it, it far easier to publish articles open access than they have books, because that's what scientists are concerned about. Um, but why I was referring to this article, because what Sam's showing in it is, look, you know, the arts and humanities have been there from the start. They were doing uh, open access journals really, really early, 1990, 1991. So they've always been doing that and they were always addressing that point of view critically, theoretically, philosophically. So they are invest, uh, involved in that. Yeah, we can, we need to be perhaps a little bit more prominent, uh, if you like, in kind of uh, shaping it because we can do the, th the very things you're talking about, which is kind of interesting why they've given us all this money to do copying. They're kind of, that I think people are realising the way that we've been going is not quite working. People are, and the way that it's been driven by the sciences and companies like Elsevier and Springer, they're not really coming up with workable solutions. So, you know, Plan S, all that move to um, article processing charges, it's very hard to see how that's going to work financially. So we need other solutions and we're good at exploring that, and speculating on those kind of things. Yeah. And I'm thinking of uh, one one risk or one problem within this is, of course, the a kind of force that uh, that we also have to kind of, uh, relate to mm -hmm. in the meriting system and mm -hmm. what kind of um, ways we are evaluated as researchers, which yeah. is also for coming almost exactly the same same time as a 
the digitalization or the open access uh, work that has yeah. been done for the last 20 years and also kind of influencing mm. uh, all disciplines. Yeah. So so how, how do we manage that, that we have so many <laughs> different yeah, we have uh, we kind of yes, a lot of get stuck in the middle. Uh, a little bit. Uh, it's interesting that a lot of the Americans say that they're quite behind in open access. The UK, mm -hmm. for some reason, uh, in developing these things. I think um, I know I've got colleagues in, in Mexico and things, and they always say the American and the American apps are very professionalised. They're very concerned a lot of the time about what is and what isn't proper and what they can do as part of their profession, and they're very reluctant to, you know. To them, this looks a little bit kind of crazy or eccentric, or why are you risking your career doing this kind of thing? They've got a, v a much more definite notion of being solid. I think one of the things that we've uh, tried to do with uh, a lot of our projects, or uh, projects such as this, it's not enough for us to make things openly available uh, for the people around the world, because all that means, and that's kind of what uh, the UK government wants, it wants us to pump, pump out our knowledge and our expertise around the world. It kind of wants it to be dominant, if you like. Um, and that's, you know, there's something almost colonialist about that. So what it's important and why we make this stuff um, open source um, is what we need is other people around the world to be kind of producing their knowledge and getting their knowledge out. So uh, this is our journal we started in 1999 and the kind of a few years ago we kind of felt, you know, we've done 15 years of this. How much more do we need to do? We've got all the other projects to do, so we gave it to some early career scholars. Um, uh, once uh, Gabriela mendez Cotta, who's based in Mexico City, and we just kind of said, "Yeah, you, you need to take it on. You need to do. Uh, you need to take it on for the, the you know the next kind of generation, the next phase." So they got this um, hackers collective in Mexico City. The Rancho Electronico, and then they kind of redesigned it, and so they're going to do it the next time. So it's the idea of people in different parts of the world being able to uh, not just access our work, but to kind of uh, make their work visible so we can start. I mean, it's very hard. Uh, we're very conscious of um, not citing enough people from outside of Europe, outside of the US. Uh, often it's hard to get hold of some of that stuff, but if we providing the means, the infrastructure, for other people in different parts of the world to kind of get their stuff out there, hopefully that will be um, that will be easier in the future. I was also thinking it's it's related to this. Uh, it's uh, it's about trust and uh, the legitis legitimacy. <laughs> How do yeah. you say that? Yeah, legitimacy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, when when you are you touched upon upon that when mm -hmm. you answered now also, but. Uh, when when you start something new or very new ways yeah. of doing things, it can be hard to to do uh, to yeah well be uh, uh, trustworthy for others. Yeah. Uh, and I know that you have mentioned uh, in the Open Humanities uh, Press work, yeah, yeah. Uh, you decided also to engage very senior persons to to kind yeah. of also gain trust in that yeah. sense. Yeah. 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 But how, how is that something part of this as, as a project to do the change? How can we include also the trustworthiness? Uh, again, that's difficult. <laughs> uh, so one of the sayings is it's, um, uh, it's easy to, for a journal to be good uh, right away, but it's not easy for it to be prestigious right away. It takes about at least 10 years for a journal to be prestigious, no matter how good it is. It has to build up the reputation. So we, with this project, which is the Open Humanities Press, we kind of tried to fast track that a little bit. So we got, you know, uh, we got people like we got Bruno Latour, uh, Graham Harmon, uh, Claire Colbrook. We got kind of well-known, established academics to do series for us. We've got an editorial board that's got people like Tony Negri on it and Gary Spivak, and so you've got all those people that are already giving it a certain status and authority. Uh, so we're trying to say, look, it's not just this electronic thing, it's not just this daft online thing, this is serious, very well-known, legitimate academics um, are getting involved in that. Um, so it's one way to kind of short-track it. It does have uh, disadvantages um, because uh, that was 10 years ago, that was 2008 that we started that, and things have changed. So now when we have new 
journals that want to come on board and join us, they're doing very different things. The newer generation want to play with the format. They don't want to just put a, you know, a journal that looks like it could be printed off. They don't want to just put that online. They want to experiment with the form, with the form of organization. And the problem with having um, the more established names uh, with it is they don't always quite see that. They're still operating on the basis of, well, all my career, a journal has looked kind of like this. Uh, and so they don't recognize something if it's coming um, from somewhere else. So one of the one of the journals we had, I had a, a I was feeling uncomfortable with trying to get this through was um, another peer review journal it comes out of Aarhus uh, in, in Denmark. And what they do is they produce issues by bringing a community together, uh, usually at the Transmedia Early Festival. Uh, in Berlin, and that's scholars and uh, often students, and then they work on an issue like that. Now, from a very traditional point of view, that can look kind of strange. Why aren't you bringing in scholars and academics from all over the world? Why are you publishing some people that are students? What is, what is that about? That doesn't look quite proper. But for us, it seemed a kind of more interesting, collective, far less individualistic, this kind of heroic model of this virtuoso author that most of those older theorists are still working on. It seemed like they were trying to loosen some of that up, so we were quite excited about that. But then that's hard to get people to kind of assess that on its own merits rather than saying, why doesn't it look like the old model of a journal? Yeah. And it's difficult. Yeah, it's very, it's very difficult. Yes. <laughs> so what we're trying to do with this board now is, is include, add to the the more prestigious people, uh, people who have got more experience in producing mm -hmm. this kind of stuff and adding their experience to it so we can get more diverse views on what a proper journal is, what a quality journal is. And then I, I uh, maybe I, this is also a hard question, but uh, if you think of uh, the, the things that you're talking about, the knowledge production and, and how we kind of uh, communicate the knowledge to others, mm -hmm. Uh, now you're talking about also the knowledge production itself kind of open for others. Yeah. Uh, that's also the example of the other platforms that are used for communication today and so on. Yeah. Uh, and when does it uh, end being part of being research? When does it become something else? Or, oh. or uh, when does it become art? For oh, example? when does it become art? <laughs> uh. Is there is there a yeah. boundary of that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose I think of my work as operating in the boundary between philosophy and theory and art and media. Um, and there's kind of a little bit of politics in there and activists, you're trying to make interventions. I'm, uh, and my colleagues are often not happy with me when I th say this. I'm kind of a bit wary about positioning it as art. Because it feels to me that art has a certain function in society, not all of it, and it's too simple, but it's a kind of a space where you can play in an experiment. And it's a bit like, okay, you want to play an experiment, you go and do art. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is take some of those ways of working and saying, okay, what if we have those ways of working, but we put them in other places that aren't art. Rather than using art as this kind of safe space to do the play, what if we put it into philosophy? What if we put it into history, which is not the, uh, what can we say, most avant-garde of disciplines? Uh, what if we put it in other parts of society? What if we put it into um, you know, uh, business and experiment with business models and kind of taking that kind of artistic sensibility, but you know, taking it in other spaces that seems to us more interesting, more kind of challenging, more, um, Productive. Do you have any ideas of how we could kind of nurture anti Bourgeois everyday academic practice in the small scale, in our sure. seminars, in, yeah, yeah. in our institution, become more kind of complex, nurture complex academic identities? Yeah. Uh, I mean, academics are fragile often, <laughs> intellectual. Uh, fragile, being anxious of losing their authority and so on. Um, and also, I mean, of course you f can find these kind of pockets everywhere and I, f I think you can find many here at Malm University. 
but then you also live in a more and more in a kind of trans and multidisciplinary environment. So even if you nurture that kind of academic behavior, mm -hmm. it might be tricky in yeah. other places. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I suppose that's partly what I'm doing here. I'm doing here saying, look, this is some of the stuff you can do. You don't have to do it exactly like this. Um, uh, sometimes the way that the right works politically is you get kind of really people on the extreme that will kind of come up with some ideas. Uh, and then the conservative politicians will go, well, at least we're not as crazy as those people. We can just add, you know, we can do our kind of less crazy policies and things. And they get them enacted in that way. So you can think of me as a kind of slightly different version of that. Uh, I've got all this extreme, eccentric stuff. You don't have to be as crazy as this. You don't have to do that. But you can try. And the other idea is to show, look, you can do this. You can play. You don't, it doesn't have to be. You think it has to be a given way. Like this is just common sense. It's always been like that. But you don't have to do it that way. You can loosen it up. You can experiment. Some of all of this stuff came out of experiments with teaching. Um, so I was talking earlier about when I started at my institution, um, we wanted to experiment with the teaching because we didn't feel we could do something interesting in media. Um, we couldn't uh, get, um, we couldn't do something interesting by trying to copy the old guard because we didn't have the money, we didn't have the professors, we didn't have all of that kind of stuff. But we can do things like this. We could do things that the more established uh, institutions in the UK wouldn't do, either because they've got too much to lose, they've got too much reputation and identity built into it, uh, or they're just too slow moving. So we can kind of do this more eccentric, faster moving stuff. So we opened up all our teaching. Um, we got tired of every time you started a lecture or a class and telling everyone, please put your, turn your phones off and put them away and close your laptops and stop surfing the net. Uh, and this was yeah about 10, 12 years ago. And so we said, OK, well, let's go with it. Um, and so we, we did all the stuff about asking people to tweet their lecture notes and open it up. And so we opened uh, all the classes up into, to people who were not just in the room at the time, but anyone that could wanted to watch them around the world. Um, and the main way, one of the main ones we did this was photography. Um, and that got a lot of attention because photography, particularly at that time, probably still now, is, is a strangely conservative of all the kind of areas in media. They still want to do black and white. They still want to do, you know, debate the merits of film. So they weren't wanting to do all the, the new digital stuff. And so that created a certain amount of uh, pushback or controversy. And you kind of opened that up um, and just and played with that a little bit. Um, played with that um, changing the dynamics. So we had kind of hierarchical lecture theatres and we changed it a bit more flat like this. Yet this is all still facing one way. And none of our cl those classes do that. They're all kind of mixing matches, more like the space we were in earlier in the week. And yeah, just ran with that a little bit. Well, thank you for a fascinating talk. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't want to be dull, but if, if, if we say that the truth is not uh, really the academic currency anymore, because people aren't interested in, in the truth, yeah, yeah. What, what are we to do? What are, we, are we to become... As you, perhaps more political, more arty. How how are we to oh. to compel <laughs> people if we can't have the truth as our sort of goal anymore? Okay, so the point I was making. Uh, oh, that's a big question, isn't it? Uh, what do we do about a lot of uh, a lot of truth? I mean, that's a whole big. Um, yeah, how, I mean, there's lots of debates around at the minute about uh, are we going to um, get our facts back? Can we kind of do that? There's a big um, movement in in the art world, and I'm trying to think what it's called. Um, but around, I don't know if you know forensic architecture, people like that, where they're kind of uh, intervening in certain situations by they get a whole load of data, and then they kind of show, and it's kind of really this pushback about saying, look, we're going to have uh, facts, and they're going back to that. Um, I'm kind of not sure about it. I understand, uh, and maybe in some occasions it works because here we're not trying to push just one model and say that. We are, I was careful to end that things have to be a bit more messy and multipolar and pluralistic. But I was kind of saying, um, I don't think that arguing in terms of the new kinds of politics we're seeing at the minute, just hitting people back, um, all those kind of right-wing populists hitting them back with, but this is the fact, here's our research, we've, we've got the empirical data they don't care. They're not operating on that level. There's something much more effective going on. There's something much more 
uh, it's about power. Um, so just trying to reason with them in a kind of the way that we've always done about good liberals and like, look, let's get a reasoned argument and this will really defeat them. It doesn't matter. They're just changing their opinions. We've seen how Trump works. We've seen how Boris Johnson works and other people are doing it in a, you know, you see people trying to debate them in TV studios and it doesn't, doesn't work. It's Jordan Peterson, all the kind of same stuff. So what we're trying to do is just make different kinds of interventions. We're trying to do it organisationally, we're trying to do it institutionally, and it's more about making interventions in particular situations. Um, so in Bo's book on kind of collaborative media, it talks about the importance of choosing where you're going to intervene and how that inter intervention is going to happen. Uh, and that's difficult. It takes, um, it takes a certain knowledge, it takes a certain experience, it takes a certain skill, and sometimes it takes a bit of luck if you just kind of hit on the right thing. But it's that kind of way of operating rather than just saying, here's the truth. You know, in the UK, we've got all this stuff around, you know, people don't want experts anymore. They don't want us coming at them and saying, you know, we've done the research, this is what you should all believe. They're kind of pushing back at that. So we've got to find different ways of engaging, intervening. Do you think also uh, one way of doing it would be to be more open on the research process and, and what's going on while you are doing practicing research, like s many people uh, engaging in, in gender studies or, yeah. or art, yeah, yeah. doing art research. They are more into the process uh, to sure. sort of showing their doings. Yeah. Uh, that's very tempting. We were having some discussion the last two days about if we just made it more clear about how democracy works, then people wouldn't get so angry about some of the complications and the frustrations about it. Again, I'm not quite sure. I don't know that it's just a matter of explaining better or explaining the process. Um, again, we've got a temptation to work like that. If only we could, you know, that's what we are. We're part of us as teachers. If only we could teach better, then you would understand and you'd kind of agree with us. And I'm not sure that's where things are quite at at the moment. Um, that sometimes it works and a lot of the time we're just getting a pushback at the moment. So, yeah, and we're trying to, I mean, obviously, we're making a whole load of knowledge available for lots of different people around the world. Uh, and, yeah, it's on, lots of it's on feminism and gender politics and identity politics. And, yeah, we want people to be able to access this stuff and, and learn. But we're trying to make more kind of incisive interventions. And that, whether you call that art or activism or politics, it's kind of different ways of thinking about it. Do you see this as something for researchers, or could uh, others be part of the co-creating process? The co-creators. Yeah. Uh, oh, let me show what examples can we do? Okay, so uh, we've got two series like this. This is the, li uh, the living books about life, and we've also got the liquid books, uh, and they're open for anyone to get involved in. Um, so they're published on a wiki, which means that. Um, Anyone can come along, rewrite it, re-edit it, reshape it, take the stuff, take it somewhere else. Um, so that's kind of open for a diverse community. We kind of don't always, with a lot of, particularly the Open Humanities Press, some of the people we work with, they don't want to gather the data. They're not into that kind of surveillance. So we don't know how many people use this often. We don't know where they come. I've got a rough idea in it. I had a, at some point some idea of how many different countries, but it's a lot. Uh, and they're not always students. Um, so they are open for different um, uh, communities and so right at the end we were talking about the pirate care things and again a lot of the people that we're working with are kind of uh, see themselves as more uh, activist. I'll get there in a minute. There we go. And so they're kind of much more linked up to these kind of projects which are not really um, academic at all, so we, at a power care conference the people from Sea Watch turned up and they're kind of talking about, yeah, they go out onto the ships, they rescue migrants in the Mediterranean and they can talk about why they're doing it and I said, no, I'm a theorist, I can kind of create problems for it, I can kind of, you know, are you sure? And that's a bit essentialist, but you know, they're going out on the sea, they're risking arrest, drowning, you kind of think, maybe now and again I'll just shut up and let people do something <laughs> that's kind of brave and important and... Uh, so yeah, it's trying to connect. At the same time, very wary of having this inside-outside notion or having this, you know, somehow we, I don't know how about if you have it here, but we have this 
thing about we've got to have an impact on society, ideally economic impact, but you know they would settle for just having an impact on the ordinary person. I'm very suspicious of that. It seems like you know it's tied up with neoliberalism, the emphasis on being instrumental, about our work having a use value. Um, but that notion of the public, that notion of our way of working, when I was talking about that change uh, in modes of communication to the kind of fourth, that just seems gone now. That seems to that seems to be going with the era of the book, this kind of notion that there's private and a public. So sometimes when I'm doing talks, I'll refer to things like uh, Edward Snowden, but we could go back to... I'll skip through this a few, a few more times. Uh, you go back to the Cambridge Analytica scandal, um, all those kind of things which are basically showing us there is no public and private anymore. That kind of boundary is going, uh, going. And so and I know Facebook panics now and again and goes, oh God, you know, we've blurred that too much and somehow we have to show that we're really safe by pretending that we're going to go back and protect people's privacy. But that old notion of the privacy that came with the invention of the book and particularly the invention of the kind of the handheld book that you could then go and you'd go um, into a study, like Virginia Woolf, the room of one's own, or when I first went to university, libraries were all, you know, you had the, even those little corrals that, that they came from monasteries and you'd be in this little closed space because you're this individual and you're going to read this stuff. I don't know, I haven't seen your library, but our library's much more like this. They're all sitting around, they're all kind of chatting and having coffee and they're on their phones or whatever. It's not that individualistic way of working. So this library, whereas it used to be a, a kind of a thing where all this knowledge from outside would come in and it would kind of zone down on the individual, that's not how libraries are now. They don't have that uh, inside-outside boundary. Poor librarians, I know we still have a quiet floor, but they're not spending so much of the time running around telling people, be quiet, you're in your individual little space, stop annoying other people. It's already more open, more kind of fluid, porous, complicated. It's all that kind of shift away from that history uh, of the book into something and we're in the middle of the change that's why we don't quite know what it's going to look like but we're going to have to explore it and try and shift it in our um, in the ways that we're happy with which is why I'm kind of increasingly moving to uh, challenge that liberal humanist notion of the subject so I didn't do it all here but there's all this stuff around you know some of us have been talking about um, the relation between the human and the non-human, and you refer to people like Timothy Morton and Isabel Stengers and Dora Haraway and Rosie Bridotti, who are all about kind of blurring that relation between the human and the non-human, and yet they all really insist on claiming copyright as these individual virtuoso authors, whereas, you know, you can't claim, if you're a monkey, you don't get copyright. Uh, so that whereas Donna Howe is really trying to blur this boundary between the human and the non-human, she kind of really reinforces it constantly, the way that she works. And that seems to be kind of hangover from the kind of process that we're all talking about. So what some of us now, in the last workshop, we were talking, I was trying to push it, I was probably seen as eccentric and mad, you can comment later. Uh, but uh, trying to push that, what is it going to be to author something with a monkey if we're going to give them copyright? Or rivers, we were talking about rivers have now been given rights can we kind of co-author a text with a, with a river or an ecosystem or a forest? And what's that going to look like and how we're going to get that peer-reviewed and evaluated and take account of that? I mean, this is the kind of questions we're moving into. We're already addressing those in the legal sphere where people are given, the, is it Ecuador's given the Amazon human rights to try and protect it from deforestation and from Brazil thinking we can burn this down because we want to. Uh, since it's getting human rights, can we start publishing with those kind of systems, those kind of entities? We already do. Books are made out of trees. We just don't acknowledge it. We kind of hide it away. But thinking about what that does for our notion of the, the liberal individual, that's kind of what I'm working on next. Hi. Um, Hello. Um, just a naive question. Um, I tried to access your book yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, Pirate Philosophy. Yeah. And uh, it was $42. And <sighs> don't, don't ask me this with Doug in the room. This is just... I, I genuinely wanted to read more, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> 
There we go. See, that was really got me out of a really difficult situation. Um, yes. Uh, so one of the things about that book um, is uh, people do raise that question um, and why is it, you know, but a lot of that book, as Doug knows, is already available online. It's just not in a book form. Uh, it's on different kind of forms. So when people were saying, why have you got this book and it's in this kind of a form and we can't get hold of it, it's kind of there that's still privileging the book form. You could find different versions of some of that material other places, but people really privilege the book, which is, I do too. Um, and why I'm still interested in publishing with MIT and I still read all those kind of books. The book's really nice and valuable. It's got, it does a lot of work, authority and whatever, but it was interesting that people would rush to that kind of criticism or complaint. Whereas you think, well, you know, there's bits of that that are on blog or online or somewhere else. You can get that. But everyone wants it in that particular form. I'm kind of intrigued by that. So it's not just, it's expecting people like me to do a whole load of work. And I'm, I am trying and I'm doing my best. But it's like everyone, mm, why haven't you done this? You need to do this. And it's like, well, you know, other people need to maybe you know, move a little bit. You kind of adjust a little bit and you kind of meet me halfway and we'll get there. You also find pieces of Donna Haraway on the web here and there. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you find yeah, lots of people. I mean, it's not, no one's kind of refusing it. It's, yeah. I've got a question of academic strategies. I mean, okay. if you're an established scholar, it's fine to experiment in new forms. But if you're a PhD student or postdoc, yeah, yeah. there's not a risk or... Or is there any more? Are we getting closer to a stage where it's actually pointing and showing that you're ahead? Yeah. Or how far are we in that yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yes, going back to the, the OHP example, that's, you know, it was all the more serious scholars who've been through the process and they're much more, at that point, they were kind of, okay, we can take a risk now, we can start experimenting with this, uh, we can do that. We, what we want to do is get to the stage where people at different stages of their career can do it, and early careers, uh, people can do it as well. Um, firstly, it's not an either-or thing. So, and as I've been saying, you know, I do publish in conventional ways and more experimental ways. Um, you can publish open access and non-open access. Uh, different projects are experimenting with different things. You're not trying to do uh, everything uh, all at the same time. The way I've explained it, uh, I was doing it the last few days, is, you know, the whack-a-mole game where the mole pops up and you hit one on the head with a mallet and then another one pops up and you keep doing it. You can't do everything all the time. You can't hit all the moles all the time. Uh, you've got to hit different moles at different times. So sometimes it'll be author, sometimes it'll be copyright, sometimes it'll be the fixity of the book. We're just trying to explain, uh, explore some of that and challenge some of those uh, things. Why should early career scholars do this? Well, uh, if you want a career, if you want to get to be a professor, when you get to professor stage, they're going to ask you, are you internationally leading? Have you done something significant? Have you done something different that other people haven't done? Are you kind of pushing things? Um, and you've got to show that. Uh, and so to have a career, to kind of stand out, to be more noticed, sometimes you've got to do something that's a bit more risky and challenging and uh, sometimes provocative. But it's still, yeah, it's very much a question of strategy. It's a kind of, you know, um, doing this for a, for a long time and a lot of people, a lot of the time, we're just looking at this stuff and going, what the hell is this? And it's only now that something like OHP, everyone's, oh, yeah, OHP, is that really, like, important and prestigious? And you're going, yeah, where were you, like, five years ago, six years ago, uh, when we got, tried to bid for that? in my university, try to get other people involved, and they were, well, what are you talking about? That's just crazy, eccentric. They weren't interested. And then you do it, and they go, oh, okay. Now we see, and now they want to get involved in it. So it's, you know, it's difficult. It is a question of strategy, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I came to think of one question uh, regarding language, actually, yeah, because yeah. Uh, when we talk about open access, when we started talking about open access 20 years ago more, uh, uh, it was open and it's still uh, talked about as making it open access for the public yeah. or making mm -hmm. making research or knowledge yeah. uh, accessible for, for a wider audience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but 
uh, within that, it's also a language issue when you when you have uh, a very precise language within your yeah. discipline, and that that counts for every discipline. I, I would say mm -hmm. that you have a certain way of expressing your thoughts uh, or your research, mm -hmm. and um, is that something that you're experimenting also uh, with when you have other ways of Mm. Uh, producing the, the knowledge or, or uh, to use other kinds of words or okay. language. So <laughs> we're not talking about just being in the English language. We're talking no, no, about no. we're talking about writing in Academic theory boy speak. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, as a theorist, this is a question I sometimes get. Yes. Um, and there is a pressure to kind of write in a more everyday language, kind of uh, often more journalistic. Even in newspapers like The Guardian, it's like, oh God, academics again. It's a difficult, it's a rare, it's a certain kind of discourse. I'm kind of, uh, although I do use different discourses in different places, if you're blogging or you're writing in different uh, medium, I'm kind of pushing back against that, I guess, a little. Um, if I was an artist, you wouldn't be expecting me to do Soviet realism all the time. You wouldn't be able to kind of me just doing like balls of fruit that you really recognised and that everyone and that my, my, my parents, I did only recently noticed this, every picture they had in the house was of a cottage for some reason, I don't know. I think my dad grew up in a cottage. So he, I, don't think, I asked him and he didn't really, he only realised when I said, but look, they're all cottages. So he had all these kind of really realistic pictures of cottages in the countryside. And he could really understand that. That wasn't really challenging. It wasn't confusing. There was nothing conceptual about it. It's great. So if an artist, if I want to be abstract or surrealist or conceptual, you're going to go, yeah, you're an artist. You can do that. But somehow I'm a theorist. I have to write that everyone, that my mum and dad can understand. Yeah, the only thing my dad... It's all right, he's not going to... Well, my dad's dead. My mother's not going to watch this. But, you know, the only ever time he ever engaged with any of my work, he said, oh, that title is really complicated, isn't it? Why, you, why do you have the kind of complicated titles? But, you know, you're not expecting other people in different, different discourses. If you work in literature, not everything has to be realist. You can have all sorts of different. So why is a theorist, can I not do something else? Can I not perform with the language, uh, play with the language, be challenging with the language? That's what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying necessarily to reach everybody. I don't know who this mythical everybody is because there is no mythical everybody out there there are different people in different jobs, careers, positions. That you would, even if you're trying to reach them, you'd have to write in a different, different way. But I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to make certain kind of interventions. And I try and use the appropriate modes for doing that and for pushing and challenging and things. Um, so, yeah, I got into trouble because someone was presenting at my university and they were saying things like, yes, we need to really communicate easily and stop using this abstract line, I think, my expressions were very, <laughs> my unhappiness with that were very visible. But yes, I'm pushing back a little bit. That. And I know, uh, I understand it. But I, I actually asked it because I think there is a mix-up now when, when you talk about op open access that sometimes it's kind of transfer to research communication. Yeah. And I don't think that is the same no. thing. So, no, no. so I think it's important to find a way to talk about it like you do. Yeah. I mean, in one sense, it feels like the, the traditional kind of way of publishing is, you know, I mean, peer review, for example. Many PhD students or doctoral students are requested to peer review more yeah. and more for big conferences. I mean, it's not senior research as a university, so in, in one way. It's, but if you think this, I mean, open uh, publishing, experimental forms of publishing, and we think about some kind of peer review or whatever, mm -hmm. do you need to nurture other kinds of skills yeah. to do that and also how to navigate to understand of course, yeah. video text snippets whatever yes so the last few days we were talking about someone was talking about literacy and uh it's funny that when we talk about our competency to peer review or engage with stuff like this we'd still talk about literacy and because of that kind of move that i'm talking about out of the gutenberg era of the book and and writing uh which is what I was getting at when I was talking about, no, no, I'm getting lost now. Uh, when I was talking about 
uh, moving out of just the, the focus on the grammatological, kind of using a bit of Stiegler, uh, if you know that. Um, get there, get there, get there, get there. There. Um, uh, and so kind of maybe we need other kinds of skills and to nurture that and not necessarily always thinking about them as another form of literacy. That kind of, can we think competency, skill, expertise outside of that kind of a different version of writing? Um, and we were trying to think in the last two days, some of us or some of us were talking about trust uh, and just different ways of, of engaging that. But yeah, we're going to have to work in, in different ways. Maybe it's going to be much more image-led. Um, uh, it's gonna, you're going to have to have those skills and students are going to have it much more than, than we probably do, uh, a lot of us anyway. And so it's how to, how to do that, yet at the same time, maintain some rigour, maintain some kind of that. You know, I'm a theorist, I'm a philosopher, I, I kind of want that. I don't want just people coming up with any old kind of nonsense. And I, say, I was saying, going about social media, it's like, as long as you emote enough, this is kind of fine. I still want some of that. But how can you do it? How can you make... Do you, anyone seen TikTok? Have you seen this thing where they're all making dances of 20 seconds? How can you do something like that? And this is how all these crazy projects start. How can you do something like TikTok but still have rigour in it? How could you do that? Would that be art? Would that be theory, philosophy? Could you e use it to do something interesting around what we want to do? Now, I'm not dancing for anybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk. Thank you, Sola and all of you. Yeah, here. thanks a lot. Um, there's probably some coffee and tea left, and we can yeah. chat with Gary afterwards as well. Yeah. So thanks. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much for coming.